and um, we're going to spend the next about um, 25 minutes talking about the link between nutrition and cognition uh, in children, and we'll talk a bit about, um, these are our learning objectives, so we'll talk about timing and how that's related to uh, nutrition and cognition in children. Uh, we'll talk about self-regulation, what that means, and uh, why that might be relevant to infant and toddler feeding practices. And then we'll talk about um, some recommendations for promoting uh, infant and toddler nutrition. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start by uh, looking at um, <clears throat> really how, how early cognitive development, how brain development uh, occurs, and there's a, uh, uh, an epigenetic changes that um, are influenced by the genetic blueprint and then by the environment. And what we've learned from the, particularly from the neuroscientists, is that this process starts uh, prenatally. We think that it probably starts prior to conception. Um, and then there are influences during pregnancy and then during early childhood. These are the foundation for um, really the rest of development, influencing, and I will show you some of the evidence that has led to that conclusion that um, influences adult health and growth, uh, learning and academics, and behavior and emotions. So it means that things start really very, very um, early in life. And it's very much about the timing and the context. Um, so there are both positive things and negative things that can happen early in life that can have quite long um, repercussions. Uh, this is a slide that represents brain development. Um, and one of the things I like about it is that it starts at conception. You'll see that I've drawn a red box around the first thousand days that represents from um, conception, and then you'll see birth, and then it goes up by months um, to 12, and then it goes up by years be beyond that. So the, the nine months of the um, uh, prenatal period plus 24 months for the first two years, if you multiply, that's 33 months, multiply it by 30, and that's 1,000. So you can see that in that uh, box, there's a tremendous amount of brain activity that is going on. Uh, myelination starts prenatally and uh, extends out. Synaptogenesis um, uh, starts and extends probably further than is on that, um, that diagram. Um, the visual and auditory cortex, and they happen at a specific time. Um, you're as um, uh, backgrounds in nutrition, Sure, you're familiar with the neural tube closing that happens really very, very early um, in, in gestation and is dependent uh, upon um, uh, folic acid. So the, the timing represents what happens in development. One of the things that I always ask people to do when I show this slide is to put themselves on it. Can you find your age? And then once you find your age, then what is going on in your brain right now? Not much, just trying to keep it together. So we say that if we're interested in investing in brain development, when would we invest? Ah, we would invest very early in life because that's when the foundations um, occur. So is that totally accurate? There is something going on in our brains right now, but much of it is still trying to keep it together and not to have more things pruned out. Okay, so the, the, we're going to, to um, move through uh, some of this rather quickly. So in nutrient deficiencies, we're, is, uh, we're concerned about the timing and specifically around the sensitive periods when we know that things in brain development are coming online and that brain development is dependent on many uh, nutrients. We're also concerned um, about the severity uh, for deprivations or for nutritional deficiencies, how, how severe they are, if they're severe enough. They could be toxic. Uh, if you have too much, it could also be um, toxic. We're concerned about the duration, uh, whether it's acute or chronic, and then we're, uh, the issue of recovery and uh, protection uh, is there. Um, so quickly, if we think about macronutrients, they're uh, necessary for growth 
Um, and we think about the, the uh, carbohydrates or the, the uh, uh, fuel, uh, the proteins at having to do with growth, and the, the fats and cholesterol. Um, these are what's very much behind the stunting that um, we'll, we will talk about. And we'll talk some about the micronutrients. These are the vitamins and minerals not made in the body, um, but that have uh, some specific uh, impact on various processes um, in the body. Just to mention a few that are uh, really related to um, uh, brain and, and cognitive function. And, and the number one one is clearly iodine. Um, this is probably the um, number one way that we could prevent uh, intellectual uh, disability, what we used to call mental retardation. Um, there's many areas in our world where um, they're iodine deficient. And the, the reviews uh, tell us of the, the consequences. And even if you don't get to the level of cretinism, as you see there, still the consequences on IQ of, um, uh, of having um, uh, iodine deficiency during the, um, the uh, uh, prenatal period. Um, some of the, what's happened in the area of neurosciences is we've gotten much more sophisticated in terms of our ability to measure things. Um, so it looks as though there's some evidence to suggest iodine deficiency is related to attention deficit disorder um, and uh, that, it, that there, it may be able to impact postnatal development rather than just the prenatal that we're aware of. Um, uh, iron, as you're um, aware, aids in the transport of oxygen uh, to the brain. This is the number one micronutrient deficiency um, in the world, and in, certainly in some parts of the world, we can see 60, 70, 80 percent of young children being um, iron deficient. Uh, when we look at uh, association studies, we often find it's associated with poor cognitive development. When we do intervention trials, it's not really quite so straightforward. Um, that sometimes you find associations and, and sometimes not. Uh, the um, the uh, long-term evidence, there is some long-term evidence primarily based on observational studies that suggests that uh, early iron deficiency has some long-range uh, consequences. Again, some of these come from the um, uh, neuroscience, where you're essentially looking under the, under the skin, as they say. Um, so some of the recommendations, recent recommendations, are things like the delayed clamping or the milking of the umbilical cord to try to prevent the early, early um, iron deficiency that, that we see early in life. Then, uh, of course, there's a risk of uh, morbidity. Um, and uh, gut uh, microbial uh, composition and inflammation with too much um, iron uh, as well. Um, this illustrates this uh, slide again. Illust this time we've overlaid the iron requirements. So you can see that during the first um, uh, six months of life, the iron requirements are low because they, they have come from the mother. But during the second six months, the iron requirements are quite high because growth is high. So that's this period where there's much going on in terms of development. Um, and so that's the, that's the dangerous part. It's the second half of the first year of life. And then beyond that, the requirements go down somewhat. Growth has slowed down. But that, that six to 12 months is really a very, very vulnerable uh, time. The study that we conducted in India, children at that age, 63% were um, iron deficient. So it's quite, quite an issue. Zinc, we've thought that zinc would be related to, um, uh, to cognitive development, but really like a Cochrane review says that the evidence is just not uh, consistent. There are some animal studies that have suggested, but it's, um, it's not, not uh, strong evidence. So the... Um, it, the uh, uh, trials now, uh, rather than looking at single nutrients, often look at mu uh, multiple um, micronutrients because these deficiencies often tend to uh, occur together. And um, in situations of poverty where there's a poor quality diet, there's limited access to um, diverse, these nurturant-rich uh, foods. 
So um, the, the, the trials often involve mic multiple micronutrients, uh, either as a fortification or as a supplement, um, and often um, given in, in uh, powders. Um, the, uh, the evidence on prenatal um, maternal nutrition um, is that there have been some trials, but it's somewhat mixed, mixed evidence um, in the, this area. This is giving um, nutrients to mothers. And uh, so there's, there has been some evidence, but there doesn't appear, other than one study in Nepal, there doesn't appear to be long-term uh, evidence from um, giving mothers uh, uh, in vulnerable areas micronutrients. And there's a bit, there are trials uh, in existence now looking at preconception. This is one from Vietnam um, where they found some uh, uh, evidence on, not from multiple micronutrients, but this was iron folic acid compared to folic acid. And they found some evidence of uh, an impact on fine motor development at two years of age. Again, these, um, what we would, like, it's hard to be funded, is to have it long enough to know whether it's sustained um, and, and uh, to understand a little bit more about what the mechanisms are that, that are doing this. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, stunting and then about feeding behavior. So what we've learned is that stunting by age two, so that's the end of the first thousand days or stunting within that first thousand days, is associated with poor school performance during childhood, uh, low human capital during adulthood, and I'll show you some evidence about it going into the next generation. There's evidence from uh, uh, several trials. So the, the impact of stunting is an economic impact. So Jim Kim, who is the president of the World Bank, is all about stunting, all about stunting because of the economic uh, impact that it has on individuals, on families, and on, on uh, countries. So this is what it looks like. A child who is stunted, as you see the little guy in, uh, on your left in the red shorts, uh, is not thin, it's not thin, um, but is, uh, his, his linear growth has slowed down. So that first, if you don't have enough um, uh, to eat, first, you know, your weight gain slows down and then your linear growth slows down. So uh, th this is what a stunted child would, um, you know, would look like. Um, this is evidence from a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a trial among a, a meta-analysis among uh, uh, children. And you can see that all of the findings um, are that the, there's a negative consequence of being stunted uh, prior to age two. And when you put them together, of course, you you find it, um, so that stunting by age two is associated with lower cognitive performance. These are done controlling for uh, socioeconomic status and other potential confounders. Uh, so what are the long-term uh, impacts on uh, human capital? Well, again, there's evidence that suggests that it goes uh, into um, adulthood. So we're not just talking about size, but we're talking about um, uh, work capacity. Um, so it's the, the whole what's what's subsumed within uh, human human capital. Um, this this is um, uh, evidence from um, uh, Pelotis from Cesar Victoria's work, looking at, at uh, long term. And the uh, the blue lines on the left are the children who have been. Um, stunted, and, and these are not even severely stunted, but you can see a kind of linear progression with, um, uh, you know, with height in terms of IQ on the left and in terms of schooling um, on the right. So it, it, you know, it crosses various kinds of uh, markers that you might look at. But what is important to know is that it is under two. So if you try to look at this with stunting at age four, it's not there. So it really is during that first thousand days, and so that's why you would want to focus on ensuring that children's growth is strong during that first thousand days. Not that we don't care about four, but the evidence is really suggesting it's during that time of very early brain formation and brain uh, development. 
Uh, this is evidence from Jamaica on, uh, these are children of mothers who were stunted. So the blue bars are the stunted mothers and the red are the non-stunted mothers. And this is the children's developmental performance uh, between 12 and 72 months. And in all cases, this is the adjusted for multiple confounders, and you can see that it's more favorable to the children of the non-stunted mothers. So this is some evidence in the intergenerational aspect of it. Again, there's work to be done on the mechanisms of why and what's happening, but this is the evidence. Um, so we see this two-generation impact. So poverty and um, it is certainly a, uh, um, a risk for early development. Um, so what happened, I'm in the child development field, and um, we have been concerned about trying to have estimates of children not reaching their developmental potential. So um, we don't have um, direct testing of children throughout the world. So we've used stunting and, and uh, poverty as a proxy to estimate how many children we have um, throughout the uh, world that uh, are not reaching their developmental potential. So this was published in the um, uh, Lancet in uh, January of 2017, and the estimate was 43% of the world's children under five, or 240 million children. Um, we're clearly working on uh, population-based estimates so we can be a little more proximal. This is far, far, far from perfect, but that is where we are at this point, and this is where they are. So you can see, and it's not a surprise, but in sub-Saharan Africa and some parts of South Asia, the, the orange is where the, um, the highest rates of children not reaching their developmental potential are, um, and then some of the, the uh, blues, the, the, like the blue where um, India is. Um, so when we don't have enough food, when we're food insecure, the first thing that happens is the quality of food is decreased. So forget about having the proteins and the, and the fruits. Um, and the uh, quality of other foods is increased, and that's the starches and noodles, so that one is uh, not feeling hungry. Uh, obviously, this is not um, uh, great for uh, children's growth or development. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then the quantity is reduced, so there's just less, less food. But it helps us understand why in some situations we see um, uh, school-aged children who are food insecure and who will be heavy because of the noodles. So if we think about the link between nutrition and cognition, there are many things that go there. It's not a clear relation. So what we're going to talk about is this. We're going to talk about feeding behavior and how that's linked to uh, nutrition and cognition. Now, how did we, why did we start thinking about feeding behavior? In uh, 1928, Clara Davis, who was a physician, um, she was in, in uh, Canada, uh, was interested in feeding behavior. So she did a study um, where she uh, recruited Apparently, um, uh, teenagers who had uh, babies or, or those who were not married with babies to um, uh, have their child, put their child in an orphanage, and uh, they were then given food to eat. So they were given an array of food, and the, uh, whatever they pointed to, the nurse would feed them. Now, the array of food that they had was um, not mixed foods, very basic foods like beans or um, a type of meat, uh, or marrow, not chips, not candy, not cookies, not anything with sugar in. So they had this very basic food. And what they did is they regulated their intake. That means that they ate and they didn't overeat, and they ate a variety of things by pointing to it, by looking at it, and then a nurse would feed them. So she did this for some time and collected lots and lots of data, big data. What did you do with big data in 1928? <laughs> well, not much, <laughs> right? So this has guided pediatric practice. Huh, not so good. I mean, it's the idea is there, one can learn from observation, but the study is a little weak. 
But the thought is, is that infants, um, and, and as, to some extent all of us, are guided by hunger and satiety. And that guides whether we'll eat, how much we eat, this self-regulation. So it's thought that, that's, that those are the cues and that uh, your baby can regulate how much they will eat. And this is the beginning evidence. There's much more to it now. So what happens is if we think for a minute about the developmental milestones of young, um, you know, of, of young children, from uh, birth to six months, there's a suck swallow and it's breast milk or formula. And then at six months, by six months, incredible development has happened. The child is now able to sit. They're able to start to pick things up. Their oral motor skills are such that they have tongue laterality. They can move food from the front of the mouth to the back and, and, and so on. Um, so they're, and they both have ways of signaling hunger or signaling uh, satiety. But what happens is children get um, a little bit older, they get um, an interest in autonomy. It, that means doing things themselves. And so if you ask parents, then they will say that their child is picky or refuses to eat. And it's up to 50% of parents will say that, that the child is, can be difficult at times. Um, and in many cases, that resolves. But sometimes, it can be a, a uh, much more serious issue, this toddler feeding problems. So if we look again at how uh, things differ between the first six months and the second six months, again, you have the first six months when they're infants, suck, swallow, breast milk or formula, and they're fed either by breast or bottle. And some children receive breast milk in a bottle. So that I'll show you, that enables us to learn a little more about bottle feeding. And then six to 12 months, they, they're much more sophisticated and they're starting to learn to feed themselves. Or as you can see, the little guy here who's giving a very clear signal, I'm not interested. Okay, so um, what we've learned is that, um, that uh, do mothers uh, cue, what we know is that bottle-fed babies gain more weight than breastfed babies. Even if the, breastfed, the bottle has breast milk in it. So does that suggest that mothers you know, try to finish the bottle? Well, there's a very clever kind of uh, uh, experiment where they used um, opaque weighted bottles versus clear bottles in a crossover design. And then they observed mother's responsivity. And what you found here is that when mothers use the opaque bottles, they're more tuned into their child, more responsive to their child and the intake is less. So they let the child, they respond to the child's cues rather than trying to empty the bottle because they have no idea if the bottle is, is empty or not. So what that suggests is that bottle feeding mothers have a risk of not responding to the child and, and overfeeding to finish the bottle out. Um, now if we look at um, infants who are, uh, um, beyond the six months and now moving into six to 12 months, there's been a thought, well, if they really regulate, should we let infants feed themselves during the second six months of life? And there have been some observational studies that say babies do or do not regulate, but now there's a randomized trial. This uh, randomized trial is called the BLISS trial done in New Zealand among middle-class families. That's baby-led introduction to solids. So they compared uh, those who were uh, randomized to receive an intervention that um, encouraged them to breastfeed exclusively at least six months and then assisted them in uh, recommending that you serve uh, iron-rich foods, that they be soft, how to avoid choking, and respond to infant signals. Okay, now let's see if this works. What, what? This is what it looks like. Hi, Connor. This little guy is eight and a half. And you see, look at his hand movements. He's not very, he doesn't have a pincer grasp. He's very interested in eating. He's not going to be distracted. But he's not very skilled at it. But he's doing it. <laughs> 
Okay, so that that's what they were studying. They a group the infants who feed themselves, and will they regulate more? Okay, so this is what we see. So if you look at it, there's no difference in their their weight at 12 and 24 months. There's no difference in their BMI BMI scores or BMI Z scores. There's there's no difference in their overweight, but uh, it's a little. And do you see the direction that it's going? It's that the bliss babies, um, it's not significant, but there's a trend there. If we look at how long they exclusively breastfed, the bliss babies breastfed four weeks more, four weeks longer, and they were more likely to delay uh, solid foods. So there are clearly differences in it. Um, if you look at, but there's no difference, it's safe. So there was no difference in adverse effects. In each cell, there was one choking incident related to milk, not related to the um, uh, to the food. Um, so there's no there's not a concern with safety, and there was not a concern with underweight, which is what some concerns were. Um, but they did breast they did um, breastfeed longer. Then, if you looked at these, are things that mothers reported or were observed. You have to be a little cautious because mothers were clearly aware of what was going on, but they were likely to say that the baby was less picky, less fussy, and that they enjoyed eating more, and they made more mealtime decisions. So these are, um, it, there's some concern about, uh, about excess uh, intake. But you see, I think that part of the point is, is that we're interested in complementary feeding. This is a time when stunting is occurring. And what this shows us is that there are ways to think about not just what children are eating, but how they're eating it. And that, uh, m from my perspective, I don't think that we think about that very much. But there's much to potentially learn from how you feed, um, how, the, how the baby eats. So a little more from a life course perspective, this is what we're expecting, that what happens early in life helps you be on a strong trajectory and that you continue up through life, um, adolescence into adulthood, and then into the next generation. If things go awry, then what we've seen is that uh, you're at risk for uh, the NCDs, and that happens early, and the disparity gets bigger and continues into the next generation. So um, the economic cost of that, uh, and this is from our uh, economist uh, colleagues, the economic cost of uh, doing nothing and continuing to have the 249 million kids not reaching their developmental potential is basically losing 26% um, of our average adult income. So the cost of this is, is really quite high. So what we try to do is to alter the curve by intervening so that those who are slipping off um, are pushed back on so that we get up closer to approximate um, the, what the ideal would be. And that's um, often what's driving the uh, early interventions and why we try to start as early as, as one can. But being cautious that rapid weight gain by age two increases the risk for NCDs. So um, you can't I think uh, only in a, in a linear way. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about what we refer to as nurturing care. This uh, was presented in the Lancet series uh, that I mentioned in January of 2017. And it's comprised of five elements, nutrition, uh, health, responsive caregiving, protection from danger, and opportunities to explore and learn and discover. So the way this works is that these five domains are all necessary. No single domain is sufficient. But if these areas are attended to, then you have the best chance of a child developing well during that first 1,000 days and basically then being on a springboard to continue to do well. But if you leave one of these areas out, then you increase the child's vulnerability. So this has gotten a lot of, of attention. One, um, this is a, a piece of evidence su suggesting that 
when you're able to put these together that there can be multiple benefits. This is a trial done in North Carolina in the 70s where uh, high-risk kids were uh, randomized either to have a, a child care center where they got good nutrition and health care and a learning curriculum for the first five years of life, or they got care as usual. And not surprising, over time, the children in the child care had, um, did better academically and uh, better in terms of their economics. And then they turned 35 years old. And what happened then is when they looked at them, bingo, they, the, they were less likely to have the metabolic syndrome. Their blood pressure was better. The folks who designed this trial never anticipated this, never anticipated this, but there were beneficial effects on, on uh, their health. So they had not gathered lots of health information because that's not what they were thinking about, but they did weigh the children. And when you look, the, the bottom three lines um, are the intervention kids, and these are the control kids. So you see very early in life, they had a weight spike. So it's that very early in life, again, it's more evidence suggesting that that's a vulnerable time for the subsequent um, NCDs, so it begins early in life. Um, so when we think about early uh, uh, feeding, in the past we've had uh, some basically unidirectional thinking that it goes from the mother to the child. That, and what we've learned is that mothers respond or caregivers respond to their children. So that interactions are bidirectional or reciprocal, that they're not all um, basically either caused by or under the control of a mother. And if anyone is a parent and you think about it, do you have control over your child? Not really. So there have been a number of intervention trials that have illustrated that when mothers are taught to respond to their infant's hunger and cues, that they are able to do so and their um, the children have a more favorable um, weight gain. Um, I'll show you what this looks like. So if a baby whines and the mother offers vegetable and the baby opens her mouth and the mother feeds a bite and now the baby fusses. So the mother has a choice. So with this choice is she smiles, offers finger food, and the baby smiles and takes the finger food and life goes on. In another scenario, same thing, the um, baby whines, mother offers food, baby opens mouth, mother gives it, baby fusses. Now if the mother pressures the child to eat, let's go, let's hurry up, what's likely to happen is the child falls apart. So the, it's, a, it's a game, it's a dance, it's a back and forth. And that's how what we try to do is to help uh, families realize the back and forth so that they're not moving into a pressure mode um, because it's likely not to work. So nurturing care is fostered by a supportive environment that begins in families, it begins at home. Um, and it's, it's embedded in what we call a social ecological model, meaning that if you want to support a child, you have to have, to have a capacity within a family for doing that, and that's supported by programs, and that's supported by policies. And this is how you build uh, healthy children, and what we would say is by doing this in this first thousand days, you work on their healthy growth and their healthy development, and that supports the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you.